Welcome to episode 13 of Military Veterans Podcast, where we talk to veterans to learn about their stories and experiences. And today we're joined by Chris Cox. Hey, Chris. Hi. How Gavin. You, how you doing? Yeah, well, Gavin. Yeah, well. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, so, Chris, it's been really, really cool that you reached out to me. And uh, well, in fact, I think it was your wife that reached out to me, wasn't it? But you're the first person that I've never crossed paths with. Okay. So it's a really, really interesting uh, point, I guess, in the podcast life um, because you're the first person that reached out and, and that's really exciting. So this is completely brand new. We're learning about each other as we go. Um, but yeah, it's going to be an exciting episode. So let's just start. Let's just relax. Um, how have you been today? Have you been, have you been well? Yeah, okay. But, yeah. Bit, bit, bit of a cold whack me last night. So if I okay. sound a bit snotty, <laughs> I, I, I apologize. Yeah. Oh, you sound fine to me. You sound fine to me. Okay. Um, but in regards to the podcast, um, have, have you listened to, to many of the episodes? I've listened to one. I listened to Jessica. I think, oh, yeah? I think it was. Yeah. yeah. F- fantastic. Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. And it's yeah. going to be great to hear what you went through during your time. Um, so, so let's start at the very beginning. Um, where was you born and where did you grow up? Right. Uh, I was born in... The country at the time was called Southern Rhodesia. Uh, I was born in the capital, which was Salisbury, which is now Harare in Zimbabwe. Um, in 1957, at the as just after Suez, when Britain was basically divesting itself of her colonies in Africa and around the world, uh, 57, I think, was the year that Ghana. Uh, what, which was the Gold Coast, got independence, and that was the first of the British colonies to go. And it sort of worked all its way down Africa through Nigeria, uh, Kenya, was still going through its Mau Mau um, uprising at the time. Um, Malawi, be- uh, Nyasaland became Malawi, uh, northern Rhodesia became Zambia, and there was a problem in southern Rhodesia. Okay, okay. So... For, for anybody that's fairly young, <laughs> um, we're talking about the continent of Africa, right? Yep. We're talking about the southern part. Uh, and as most people probably know, Zimbabwe is is the area, the country that, that used to be called Rhodesia. That's correct, isn't That's it? correct, yeah. Fantastic. Can you just give us a little snippet of that yeah. kind of like backdrop, that back story of, of the country? Um I'm also just going to say before we carry on, um, we're still learning on the go, um, but the, the tapping on the table might be picked up by by the mic. So that's cool. We're, sorry about that if you heard it. Um, but, you know, we're just being, okay. we're just being natural. Okay. Um, I might do it as well, so we'll see how it goes. Um, but in regards to yourself, Chris, um, as a kid, how did you find growing up? Was it, was it quite a comfortable growing up or, or a bit difficult? It, it, it was. Um, certainly if you're white, growing up in, uh, it was a racially divided country. Okay. Uh, it, just north of South Africa, which was fully entrenched in the, the whole apartheid regime of the time. Uh, Rhodesia was a racially divided country. It was slowly moving towards uh, integration, but not fast enough uh, as far as the black nationalists were concerned. Um, but growing up in the country, um, yeah, it was, as I say, it was idyllic. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, was you quite close to nature? Because I, I think of the southern part of Africa, or well, in fact all of Africa, being quite wild and open with lots of nature. Um, it, was that where you were or was you more in a town? Well, Salisbury or Naharari, the capital, was, was a f- fairly um, significant town. It was called a city. Uh, but... You know, five minutes outside the city limits on the outskirts, you were into the bush. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, but it wasn't wild jungle like everyone imagines. Okay. Uh, there were large farming areas, but there were there were large um, wildlife areas. For example, the Zambezi Valley, very wild. And, I mean, um, at the time there were places there where people, the tribes people living in those areas had never seen a white man. Really? I mean, it really was... Um, yeah, pr- pretty raw. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's the like schooling system in in, in that time? Because uh, you mentioned what what year is this that we're talking about schooling? This would be the sort of early sixties. Um, 
schooling, there were state schools, uh, government schools, but again, um, racially divided, racially segregated. Um, you had your black schools, you had white schools, you had mixed race schools. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to go to um, private schools or what you'd call here independent schools where they were multiracial. Um, so I grew up with a slightly different um, view on the world from my uh, compatriots who went to whites only kind of okay. uh, um, state schools. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what kind of stuff did you do outside of school uh, on weekends or after school? Pretty well what, what kids do normally. We, we were very much a sort of outdoors type country. The, the weather allowed that to happen. Very sporty, playing sport every weekend um, and going out into the bush, fishing. Yeah. yeah well, fantastic stuff, yeah. Nice. What kind of sports were you into? We were very much based on the whole British um, educational system. So um, rugby, cricket, a little bit of football, um, you know, tennis, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Were you any good at any of them? I was, I was okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And um, what is it like as you start to grow up? Uh, do you stay in the same town? Uh, does the family move to a different area? No, we stayed in, in Salisbury right to the end. Um, things changed in 1965, which was very much a, a watershed year in terms of um, the country and the country's development and mine. Um, I was eight years old when Ian Smith, who was the Prime Minister of Rhodesia, um, unilaterally declared independence from Britain. Okay. Um, only the second country ever to do so, the first being the United States. Yeah. Um, which brought the wrath of the world down upon the country. Um, Britain immediately declared, um, implemented sanctions, which was followed immediately by United Nations sanctions. So Rhodesia ev effectively became a pariah state in terms of um, the sort of world brotherhood. And uh, that, that impacted me hugely at the time. I mean, suddenly you couldn't get shreddies. Suddenly you couldn't right. get Marmite. Um, there was massive petrol rationing. The, the, the country's fuel all came in through um, Baira, a port city in Mozambique on the Indian Ocean. Um, the, the Royal Navy I implemented a naval blockade of Baira to stop um, vessels delivering fuel to Rhodesia. So, yeah, there, it, was a, it was a problem. And, I mean, my mother's fuel rationing we, we, there was fuel rationing implemented had was given one gallon a month of wow. fuel yeah so it 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 hit the country hard um and with that uh the year after the the first nationalist uh, guerrilla uh, infiltration started that they had sort of declared the the armed struggle um as it were to achieve independence um, militarily. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I grew up against that backdrop. Um, but it was still idyllic. I mean, the the, the, the war, it, it wasn't known as a war then. It was known more of as a sort of an insurgency and it was really only affecting the sort of border areas of the country, um, the Zambezi River, which bordered Zambia. Okay. Which was where the guerrillas were based externally in Zambia. Um, they'd all been sent to Soviet Union, China, Algeria, um, East Germany for military training. Oh, wow, okay. Yep, um, so they came back uh, back to Zambia and started their infiltrations into, into the country. It took a good um, 10 years before they started becoming effective. Uh, but... Yeah, from 65 onwards when, when Smith declared UDI as it was, Unilateral Declaration of Independence, um, then declared the country a republic illegally as, as well at the time, still regarded as a British colony. Um, and the guerrilla um, armies started building up outside the country and when Mozambique, which was a Portuguese colony, um, been a Portuguese colony for 500 years almost, mm. as, as had Angola on the west coast and Guinea-Bissau up in the 
up, up in the corner of Africa towards next to um, the Cameroon. Um, those were the Portuguese um, African possessions. There was a military coup, left-wing military coup in Portugal in 1974, the Carnation Revolution as it became. Um, and kind of overnight, Portugal um, basically divested itself of its um, African colonies uh, and just walked out. Wow. Uh, yeah, and Mozambique, which had been an ally of Rhodesia's, being a Portuguese colony, um, immediately became a Marxist-Leninist state with uh, Frelimo, um, the, the Mozambican liberation movement, strongly pro Robert Mugabe's uh, Zanla or ZANU, the, mm. the, the Zimbabwean liberation movements, yeah. Wow, yeah. okay. So a, a lot of hap- big events happened very quickly. Yeah. And I think it was Harold Macmillan, the British Prime Minister, addressing the uh, South African Parliament in 1961, said the wind, there is a wind of change blowing through this continent. And that's what it was. It, yeah. it, 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 it Sounds it, like a whole change. Yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah, it did, yeah. And obviously you're on this podcast, so you were in the military. Um, So what did that look like? What made you join the military? And, uh, as you know, I suppose we've actually forgotten the four questions that I normally ask. Um, (laughs) But uh, I suppose before we do carry on with that, let me ask those four questions. Sure. Um, Because if someone's listening now, they'll they'll then get a summary of what we're going to go into. Um, I was just too excited to speak to you, Chris. I'm sorry for missing out the four questions. <laughs> um, so let me ask those four questions and then we'll carry on with, with, with your transition and what that looked like to join up. Um, so these four questions are, when did you join? What service and branch did you join? How long did you serve for? And what rank did you get to? Right. I was called up to do my national service conscription, which every white youth was um, obliged to do um, as soon as he turned 18. So I joined the Rhodesian Light Infantry, which was a regular battalion. What year was that? On the 8th of January, 1976. 76, okay, okay. So, and you mentioned it again, uh, the Rhodesian Light Infantry. Yeah. 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 Um, And does that have a branch inside of that? The Rhodesian. It it had um, it was broken down into four commandos. Okay, which was essentially a company. Right. Um, right. One commando, two commando, three commando, and support com- support commando, which was the old support group when the Rhodesian Light Infantry was a regular standard type battalion with companies and platoons. Okay. Okay. And, and what part was you of that? I. Went into, um, after I'd done my training, into three commando. In three commando. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. We'll probably cover that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Uh, and sorry, yeah, the, the other two questions were, um, how long did you serve for uh, and the rank that you got to? I served for three years, just over three years. I signed up uh, for a regular contract, a minimum contract of three years. Um, and I reached the dizzy heights of Lance Corporal. Nice. They, nice. <laughs> they offered me sergeant to stay. Really? Wow. Okay. Well, yeah. we might we might touch on that, but but so so what does that look like with um, with joining? Um, what what made you do that? You, you said you were uh, conscripted to to join. Um, was there another way to do something else, or did you have to join the military during those t- during those times? They were still re- relatively um, lax in terms, of, but 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 by nineteen seventy six, when I was conscripted, they tightened up a lot. Uh, you could actually get some kind of exemption um, or deferral uh, to go outside the country and do university, for example. They would expect you to come back and do your national service. Right. A lot of people didn't. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, by 1976, there was a nas- national service was 12 months. It, it increased as the war progressed, it started at four and a half months in 1965, then increased to six months, nine months, 12 months, 76. A few months into my uh, national service, it was increased to 18 months. And I thought, well, for an extra 18 months, I may as well sign on and do a regular three-year term and get paid for it. Okay. And by the time I did that, I was starting to enjoy it. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
So let, let's start at the beginning of joining. Um, how does that look in Rhodesia? Uh, so over here in the UK, we, we've got career offices, uh, military career offices. We, we walk in and say, hey, I'd like to join the army or whatever. Um, how does that work over there? Are there offices you go into or do you contact somebody? No, they're, they're recruiting officers. Um, they actually had a recruiting office illegally in London. Oh, right. Yeah, and uh, they used to do a lot of recruitment in the States as well uh, via magazines like Soldier of Fortune. Okay. Yeah, but they were recruiting officers. If you wanted to go and sign on as a regular, in you go. Okay. Yeah. And then because you had to do national service, you, you went in and signed on in the same kind of office? Yeah, yeah, exactly the same office, yeah. And then you went and did training. Um, so what is basic training? Is it called basic training over there? <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. No problem. Exactly the same. Um, very similar situation to uh, program a, reg a training regime as to the British Army. Nice. Um, okay. Yeah, it was a four and a half month training course. Um, I mean, a lot of our instructors were ex-British Army. Right. Um, we... we we were in effect part of the British Army. Uh, I mean, until until UDI, um, we'd fought. The Rhodesians had fought in in World War Two with the British. Um, I mean, the RAF had a couple of Rhodesia squadrons, for example. Um, Rhodesians very much involved in the the Burma campaign, um, and. Our, our sort of anti-counterinsurgency uh, uh, um, aspect developed primarily from the, our experiences in Malaya, in right? Malayan insurgency. Okay. Anyway, yeah. Uh, so very much based on the whole British system. Nice. We did six weeks. Um, the course was broken down into three phases. First six weeks was um, basic training, which I think uh, same as you guys. This focus is purely on fitness uh, drill. That sort of thing, breaking you down basically. Yeah, <laughs> getting that civvy mentality. Yeah, out yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, then the second six-week period was uh, classical warfare, and then the third and final phase of the training was um, counterinsurgency warfare. That that's a sort of holistic term for. I mean, you do all sorts of other things apart from just that. But um, after six weeks, you get the opportunity to decide whether you'd like to specialise. Right. And you can apply to go into medics or signals or engineers or, um, you know, various other branches. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and you, at, at that point, chose to go down the commando? I just aspect. stayed. You know, if you didn't make any choice to, to go somewhere else, you just stayed and carried on as an infantryman. Okay. Which I did, yeah. Which you did. Yeah. How did you find training? Was it quite difficult for yourself or was you pretty fit and it was fairly easy for you? <sighs> We were all pretty fit, um, but, I mean, it was a shock to the system, yeah. you know. <laughs> you know uh, um, I've got very flat feet, awfully flat feet, and although I was a reasonable sportsman, I mean, I could sprint well. Yeah. But over long distances, and, I mean, we had, you know, some of the route marches we had to do in our training, like we had 20 milers, which they're called, where we had to do full pack and webbing and, you know, weapons, boots, you know. That, that was really tough, really yeah. tough, you know, keeping up. Um, but you had to, otherwise you get back squatted, as yeah, they call it. you don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with it being so connected to the British, did you have a lot of British equipment that you were using? Pretty much so. Um, all, all our equipment was effectively British, but old British because of sanctions. So we got oh, nothing yeah. new. I mean, um, our standard infantry rifle was the um, British... Self-loading rifle, okay, but which was replaced pretty smartly by the um, FN FAL, so essentially the same weapon, um, Belgian manufactured, um, made and I think made under license in South Africa, seven point six two. That was a standard weapon, and our standard um, um, support weapon was what you guys, the British, call the um, GPMG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we called it the MAG. Okay. Seven point six two, exactly the same weapon. So those were our two standard weapons in, in the Rhodesian Light Infantry. Yeah. Um, other units had things like the um, Heckler and Koch G three, um, Bren guns. Yeah, I mean all the all the territorial units still use Bren guns. You know, <laughs> World War Two vintage. Yeah, yeah. I mean our Air Force still had, 
Um, Dakotas, I mean, we, one of the Dakotas when we became parrot trained that we jumped out of had, had been at Arnhem. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of history. There, yeah. There, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you mentioned then you'd done your jumps course, things yes. like that, yeah? That that happened um, after I'd been in the the army a year. Oh right, okay, yeah. okay. So so from training, um, you get, I guess you call it the same, right? You get posted away yeah. to your first unit. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and where is that? Where where is your first unit? Well, we were trained at um, the RLI barracks in Salisbury, and when you when you pass out, um, finish your training, you then get posted. Well, you, you can can choose to some extent which commando you want to go into. Mm. And um, me and my, my sort of barrack room, we all went into three commando. Okay. Yeah. And where's that stationed? That's all in our oh, sti- barracks. Still in the same place? Yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah, so you had the, the whole barracks, which was the army base, Yeah. the uh, Rhodesian Light Infantry, and it had all the commando in the base. Okay. And then there was a training troop, as they called it. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Got it, got it. So you had your own corner. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that kind of stuff. But they still find you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so you mentioned you, you've been there for, for a year, um, getting used to, well, I say a new unit, it's the same camp. So I suppose yeah. it's getting used to uh, just being out of training. Yeah. Did you have to do the jumps or did you put your hand up for it? No, we had to. You had to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were an, we were an infantry unit, but by that stage... Um, 76 was another land, uh, another sort of watershed year for, for the country in that there were massive guerrilla incursions. Um, as I said, it took 10 years to, for them to, to get to that stage, but they started flooding the country with um, thousands and thousands of um, guerrillas. Now that Mozambique had become independent and um, pro-liberation struggle, uh, Mugabe's crowd, Zanla, we're all based in Mozambique. Right. And that border alone is 1,400 kilometres. So that plus the Zambian border, you're looking at about 2,000 kilometres of border to control. And right. it's impossible. Impossible, yeah. yeah. Um, so by by 19, the end of 1976 or early 77, when I did my parachute course, um, the Rhodesian Light Infantry had was specialising in a concept known as fire force. Okay. Okay, which is really just um, um, armed response, air mobile armed response to guerrillas, like a quick reaction force, I think you'd probably call it. Okay, yeah. 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 Um, so there were these uh, so air bases dotted around the country strategically in various operational orders, all of them mainly near the border areas. Um, and so we would be posted, our commander would then be sent to one of these bases um, for a six-week bush trip, as we called it. Right. And there we would man the fire force. Okay. Uh, in conjunction with the air force. And the fire force would consist of um, four Alouette three helicopters, um, a Lynx, which was a Ream Cessna um, light uh ground attack aircraft armed with napalm, rockets, that sort of thing. Um, and that was about it. And so if there was a guerrilla sighting within distance, um, that whole fire force would all jump in the helicopters and rush off to the, the, the area and, and have a contact, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but by the end of 76, with the guerrilla numbers increasing so much, it was becoming more and more necessary to get more troops into <laughs> into action quicker. Okay. And the country just didn't have enough helicopters to do right. that. Um, so the only recourse that they had was to parachute men in. So we, were, we weren't given a choice. If you wanted to stay in the RLI, you'd have to become paratroop trained. Yeah. And jump out of Dakotas or, you know, DC-3s as they were. Okay. Um, Which from, you know, so you're sort of initial 12 men in three Alouette threes, four men in a helicopter, um, they'd come back for a second wave of troop, troops and, and what they called a land tail, 
uh, vehicle com convoy would make its way to the area with a third wave of troops and resupply of ammunition, f helicopter fuel, that sort of thing. Um, but a, a, a parachute Dakota could take technically 24 but nearer either 16 to 20 men. So you're more than doubling your initial capacity yeah, yeah, yeah. to get men on the ground. That was the name of the game, was getting troops on the ground as quickly as, quick as, as possible, possible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. before the enemy bombshelled, as, as we called it. Yeah. Um, they tended not to stand and fight. That wasn't their, that wasn't their tactics. So they were like hit and run. <clears throat> yeah, Just getting, yeah, 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 yeah. Their, 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 their main uh, modus operandi was really indoctr indoctrinating the masses, the people, very much Chairman Mao sort of tactics, mm. and then um, limited raids against um, soft targets, against police outposts, that sort of thing. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. So yeah. in regards to your uh, parachute training, mm -hmm. did, did you find that pretty easy or was you uh, – bit wary of jumping out of a pretty good vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I quite enjoyed it actually. And yeah. again, most of our um, instructors were ex um, Brit Para, ex RAF, um, a few Americans, Australians. Yeah, we really, really were a um, multinational little regular army. Um, yeah, no, I enjoyed it. And um, we were the second Rhodesian Light Infantry course to qualify. And um, we went into action almost immediately as, yeah. soon, as soon as we were back, back in the bush. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that brings me on to my next question. Um, any stories or experiences from maybe your next year um, within the commando uh, that you want to share? Yeah, the second year, 1977, it got busier and busier as more and more guerrillas were coming into the country. Um, we were doing... Uh, whilst on um, fire force operations, we were doing, we were starting to be called out to a contact every day. Right. Yep. Um, sometimes twice a day. Um, and there are occasions where some guys parachuted three times a day into a contact. So simply because we, we had international sanctions against us, we just didn't have the means to get the men in quick enough. So we had these the, the record in terms of operational parachute jumps, which is still held today. I don't think it'll ever be beaten. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I think the one guy who holds the record for the number of operational parachute descents, he was in one commando. Yeah. Um, he did something like 78. Wow. I mean, staggering. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. staggering, yeah. Um, and that'll never be beaten. I, no. I, I, never. No. Never. Yeah, so... Yeah, I mean, we get we get we got um, a lot of parachuters here, or paratroopers, uh, or even engineer troopers. You know, they, yeah. they've just done the training; they've never parachuted into any conflict. So, yeah, uh, yeah, and they don't need to. No, I not mean, not they, really nowadays. <laughs> no, they go in a Chinook or or uh, you know, uh, we did get um, the the Bell Hueys in seventy eight seventy nine. Um, got flogged to the country by some dodgy Israeli. Arms, de arms dealer. Right. <laughs> and so we bought seven or eight um, Hueys, which again vastly in in improved our carrying capacity, but they were so old and, and worn out um, that I think they had to cannibalise, <coughs> excuse me, three or four to right. make up another four or five good ones, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but again, and those are used predominantly for external raids. Yeah. Um, outside the borders of the country. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned seventy eight started to get busier. Yeah. Um, is, is there a is there a time or uh, maybe a task that really stands out for you from that from that year? Seventy eight. Seventy seven. Seventy eight. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Without going into the, all the war stories, I mean, um, there, there are a lot of and funny things as well. Um, but I remember once um, we were on the Zambezi River, um, which is in the north of the country, bordering on Zambia. Okay. We were doing, together with the Rhodesian SAS, we were doing long-range reconnaissance operations into Zambia, which was not really our kind of forte in terms of the Rhodesian Light Infantry. That should have been done really only by the SAS. Um, and... You know what the army's like. You, uh, 
idle hands find something for them to do. So we spent our life digging and building bunkers. All right. Yeah. And we had to have bunkers for the SAS to put the 12.7 machine guns and 14.5, you know, all these captured um, communist weaponry uh, to protect the camp. And uh, we were filling sandbags one day. And as I bent over to pick up a sandbag, a little scorpion was under the sandbag. This little tiny little chap, sand, you know, about big as your thumb. Yeah. Um, sand coloured. And he zapped me right on the tip of my, of this finger. Of your middle finger? Yeah. And then scurried off. Uh, uh, yeah. That hurt? Oh, <laughs> unbelievable. And scorpions' size doesn't matter. In fact, some of the smaller ones are more lethal. And within seconds, I could feel literally the poison. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. It was dreadful coming up, coursing up my veins. Um, like almost like a red hot poker, oh. it was just burning, oh. and then it finally stopped into um, the glands under my in my right armpit, and I was unbelievable agony. Oh no! And um, my mates didn't know what to do, so they sort of dragged me along to the medic, um, uh, the, the local commando medic, who was a medic. He wasn't a doctor or anything, right? Um, and said, "You got to give this guy, got to give Chris something. He's he's in." Unbelievable pain. Now, our local medics tended not to um, believe anything we did when it came to pain because we were always trying to nick the painkillers. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave me basically sort of well, here a couple of aspirin. Okay. You know. Yeah. And and then he gave me something stronger. He gave me propon. So it's getting heavier and heavier. Nothing worked. And he could see ultimately that I was in a, a lot of pain. So he went and got the a proper doctor from okay. from the SAS guys next door and he came and took one look at me and, and filled me full of morphine. Really? Yeah. Did it swell up and stuff? Or Yeah. I mean, yeah, I yeah. couldn't move. Yeah. So I was sort of now doped up fantastic. I mean, I could still feel it, the pain, but the morphine was just sort of this hazy, yeah. euphoric feeling. Like you're drunk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 but nice, you know. But nice, and yeah, 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 yeah. And I, there I lay for three days with my arm in a in this SAS little hospital with yeah. my, my arm tied up to the roof until I don't know all the poison poison drained out or yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah, but not a pleasant experience. No, no. I thought filling sandbags in the UK was bad enough. Uh, <laughs> being engineers, we had to fill up a lot of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. You would have, yeah. <laughs> No, and, um, you know, talking about um, in 77, we had a um, a British corporal in our – we had several British corporals, actually, in, in our troop. A troop was the equivalent of a platoon. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, and this was a British corporal, a guy called Fuzz Hussey, ex-SAS. I think he had – British SAS. I mm -hmm. think he had actually been at the Incheon landings in Korea. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. old guy. Uh, well, Comparatively. Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. Pro probably in his 40s. Uh, and he was uh, a demolition fanatic. So he would make us dig up, dig bunkers, um, fill up sandbags, make these beautiful bunkers, and then, we'd, then he'd teach us how to blow them up with um, hollow charges and things like that. Nice. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he was a good guy. Uh he got kicked out of the commander. He um, dishonorably discharged because he tried to word ha has it that he tried to booby trap the um, sergeant major's <laughs> bed, <laughs> <laughs> wrapped with um, cortex oh, all, wow. all, all, all around the bed frame. Yeah, <laughs> it's not uncommon that sergeant majors get uh, stuff done to them. So <laughs> even in the British Army. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. But I suppose that's part of the job, isn't it? Yeah, Is, uh, you yeah. gotta take the rap for the guys, but yeah. uh, they sometimes don't like it. Yeah. Um, that's really cool. Thanks for sharing those stories. That's 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 really fun to hear. Um, I mean, we don't have to go into uh, operational stuff if you want to share anything uh, from, from training or anything like that. Um, but obviously, you said you were in for three years. Yeah. Uh, 76 was when you joined. Um, and obviously, 78 is two years after. So I'm guessing what you're coming near the end of your career, uh, the time that you signed up for, um, but what does that look like? What, do you start 
going from post to post, task to task. Uh, how does that look? Yeah. From about 1976, um, I'll just give you a bit of background here. Yeah, go for it. Um, with the guerrillas um, establishing bigger and bigger base camps in Zambia and Mozambique, uh, which were where they were training the recruits and from there arming them and then infiltrating them into the country. Uh, and some of these were massive, some of these base camps, um, five, 10,000 recruits. Um, the Rhodesians had been, for, uh, the Rhodesian military for a long time had been pressing the politicians to be allowed to do preempt, preemptive strikes um, against these um, enemy camps in Zambia and Mozambique. Um, but there'd always been a little bit of, of reticence in, in terms of breaking international law, didn't want to upset um, the host, the guerrillas' host countries for fear of getting the Chinese or the Russians or, in fact, the British involved in, in supporting them against us. Um, I mean, just a little aside here, I mean, uh, when I mentioned earlier about the British naval blockade of Bara in 66, 67, the same time the British army, well, the British were thinking about an invasion of Rhodesia, um, sending in the parachute regiment, apparently, mm -hmm. from, from Zambia. I mean, this is against what they, what we called then against uh, their kith and kin. Um, anyway, I, I digress, but getting back to the external raids, uh, they became, eventually the politicians gave the green light and um, a series of external raids were implemented. The first one is was in late 1976 when the Salu Scouts, you might have heard of them, um, they um, attacked a Nyadzonia camp in uh, Mozambique and killed about 2,000 uh, guerrillas. So the success of that um, set, the, set the tone for further guerrilla sort of external camp, uh, camp raids involving from then on the Air Force. Right. So we could go in against these guerrilla camps um, outnumbered horribly, mm. but because we had... Um, Air power, we had air superiority. Um, yeah, we were successful. I mean, for example, the biggest raid in 1977, um, November 1977, involved two commando, three commando from the RLI and the entire SAS regiment, mounted to about 196 troopers in all, with air support, attacked. Um, a camp in Mozambique, about 100 kilometres across the border, uh, with probably five to 6,000 guerrillas in camp. Um, not all of them were armed. Um, a lot of them were um, recruits. But uh, certainly the, the camp guard um, were armed, trained by Chinese advisors, some Russian, Cuban advisors, um, and they had some pretty high-powered weaponry. But... Uh, we went in there, but with the Air Force, um, our Canberra bombers and Hawker Hunters, ground attack aircraft, softening up up the camp, um, and then the paras would be dropped and the helicopters would come in and create a complete ring around the camp and then sweep in towards the camp. So that became the sort of um, the model for, ver for further camp attacks. Mm. Um, yeah, so much so that by... Late 78, 1979, the, the Rhodesian Light Infantry was moved on to purely external operations. So the local fire force operations within Rhodesia would become controlled by other units, Rhodesian African Rifles, various territorials and the like. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, so 78, 79 were the years of the big camp attacks and then end of 79, ceasefire, April 1980, independence. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. So just going back to those camp aspects, um, was was it was the task to get in there and, and just seize the people inside there and if any resistance kind of, you know, fight back type thing or what, what was the task when you were going in there was there was one aim to go in there and just kill as many as possible yeah um, and and capture if, if possible yeah um, but 
um, yeah, it was just really just to reduce Zanla and Zipra, reduce their numbers. Yeah, yeah. Um, but all it did, I mean, it, 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 it did achieve its aim, but it, it all happened too little too late. And by the time the Rhodesian raids went in, the guerrillas were well established in, in those countries and um, all they did was move their camps uh, further into the interior. So, um, I mean, some, some of them were 200, 300 kilometres inside the country and that's a long distance mm. for a strike force to go into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Even with vehicles, you know, yeah. you're tired just yeah. being tra- travelling on the yeah. vehicle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so you come to the end of your time within the military. Yeah. Um, well, it wasn't quite the end. It wasn't quite know. the end? No. No? Okay. Because no. the way it worked was was you did your, your initial either national service or, yeah. or your three years or whatever, but you weren't um, – you were still um, expected to do call-ups. Oh, right. So the military could call you up if need be. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure what they call it here. It's it's like the reserve. You go into like yeah. the, the army reserve, for yeah. example, and um, in peacetime you've probably got to do one camp of six weeks a year or something okay. or two weeks or three weeks or whatever. But during um, our bush wars that had become known, we, we would be expected to do um, by 77, 78, six weeks in. It became known as six weeks in, six weeks out. So you do six weeks in the army six weeks as a civilian. Right, okay. Which is not sustainable. No. Um, you can't run an economy on that basis and um, you can't live a life on that basis, yeah. So it's it's six weeks in, six weeks out, and then another six weeks in. Yeah. Six, really, so yeah. that that's how it w- was rolling. Yeah. Wow, that couldn't be yeah. comfortable. Not did, at all. And you lived that? You lived no, that yourself? No, I, I, I didn't. Um, you didn't? I was okay. slightly fortunate that when I did my three years and a bit with the RLI, I then demobbed, right. but I was still officially a member of the Rhodesian Army. I okay. just wasn't in the RLI anymore. And I would be expected to go and do my six weeks with my local um, territorial battalion Yeah, uh, in Salisbury, I think it was um, – one, one, the first battalion, Rhodesia Regiment, it was called. Okay. <clears throat> but I'd got a job down on the um, the eastern Lowfeld next to the Mozambican border. I'd got a farming job. Right. Down there on a, on a big cotton and wheat um, irrigation scheme on the Sabi River. And I wouldn't have got the job if they knew I had to do six weeks in, six weeks out. They, it was a little bit of a catch-22. So all I did was went to the local um, police reserve and signed up with the police reserve. Right. Because you could do that um, in situ in, in a farming area. Um, it was like being in the army, but you were now, you were now a policeman or paramilitary policeman, yeah. Mm. What was called the British South Africa Police, which was the nothing to do with Britain or South Africa, but right. it was, <laughs> that goes back to Cecil Rhodes. That, that, that was the... It was the Rhodesian Police Force. Okay. Um, so I signed on. They took me with open arms. They needed um, people with combat experience. And I joined what became known as the as PARTU, which was the Police Anti-Terrorist Terrorist Unit, okay. which was a, a part of the police reserve. So I wasn't a regular policeman. I was a paramilitary um, doing um, territorial-type operations. So going from the farm, I would go on patrols or... OPs or that sort of thing, right? Or called out in reaction to uh, contacts or incidents, um, but you're still living at home, at your house. Okay. Um, yeah, um, and you'd get together with various farmers in the area and in your little party stick. The joke was that I was still hadn't been officially demobbed from the army, and if they had found me, the military. <laughs> Police had tracked me down. <laughs> I could have been arrested. Oh, no. <laughs> but, I mean, anyway, uh, I think that the country was such a mess by that stage that they never did. Yeah, yeah. And, and just to say it again, what year was that that you that was left? I'm doing it with the air quotes. <laughs> yeah, that was in February '79. I left the okay. RLI, and then almost immediately joined the police part two, and I did that up until Zimbabwean independence in April. 
Got it. Yeah. Got so it. another 15 months. Okay. Of, okay. And uh, combat. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And I suppose that transition away from the military, going into, even if it was like reserve police, still having that kind of mentality yeah. of, uh, you know, I don't know, but abiding by laws, enforcing that. Yeah. Um, did that help you, you think, um, from that aspect? Not really, because the, the whole country was now on a 100% war footing. Right. I mean, you couldn't drive outside your town. You had to go in a military convoy. Okay. Um, you couldn't. Uh, the guerrillas were now starting to uh, strike the cities. Um, in late 78, they hit the fuel storage depot in Salisbury. A guerrilla commando raid. I mean, it was a very well executed raid. And they destroyed pretty well the country's entire fuel reserve. I think the country was down to after that to weeks fuel. No way. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the country was on the back foot uh, in terms of the war. It was just sheer numbers. There were vast areas of the country that had been liberated, technically liberated okay. by the guerrillas. Yeah. Effectively no go area unless you went in there with your with troops. Yeah. Um so yeah, it it was um becoming more and more of a uh, a daily scenario for the war, mm. of, of, of war. Um, and it was affecting, I mean, farmers were being shot and killed, missionaries were being shot and killed. Um, every day they would have what they called the security force communique uh, on the radio or TV where security force communique would say today how many people are being killed, how many guerrillas are being killed, how many uh, people caught in crossfire, mm. if in, effectively rural civilians, um, or running with the guerrillas or, or caught in the crossfire. And every day um, there would be increasing numbers of people being killed. And that was even after the ceasefire that, that had, a, had still, happened? It still kept going into early 1980. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Yeah. And, I mean, you, you can... Uh, Hold off on this question if you so will, if you wish. Um, but going forward, as you you know, start to transition uh, effect effectively back into civilian life, I'm guessing you saw a lot. It sounded like you were very busy during your time within the commando unit. Um, what was your kind of mental state of mind when you became a civilian again? It was, well, when my party stick, a stick was a unit of four to six men, um, and I was a, the stick commander. It's kind of like a section or, or half a section. Um, and my party stick, um, we had our last contact three or four days before... Zimbabwean independence. The country had supposedly been in a ceasefire situation f since December 1979, December, January, February, March, April. So for four months, the country had supposedly been in a ceasefire situation. But there was a lot of jostling for position. Um, the guerrillas were all meant to assemble and designated assembly points throughout the country, all being monitored by the British, British monitoring force. Um, and the Rhodesians were supposedly confined to their barracks, so there would be no clashing, no conflict. Didn't happen like that, right. of course. Um, there were every day the massive ceasefire violations. People were still being killed. Um, but and um, three or four days before the end of before independence, on the eighteenth of April, nineteen eighty, um, one of our OPs sighted some guerrillas. And they weren't in an assembly point. So essentially they were fair game. Um, we could go out there and, and take them out, which we did. We went and had a contact. Um, and then independence occurred three or four days later. And overnight I was a civilian, had to hand in all my weapons, all my kit, all my ammunition, everything, um, back to the police. And the war stopped just like that. And um, 
it was a funny feeling when your whole being um, for the last four years had been geared to living this existence of um, uh, contact after contact after contact every day for, for, not every day, but I mean regularly for the last four years and suddenly you're a civilian mm. and all the guys who'd done six weeks and all the territorial people six weeks and six weeks, they were delighted. You know, they would go, go, go back to their their normal life. Um, there was a mass exodus of whites from the country. Um, there were sort of fears of black retribution, the massacres in the Congo the, of all, all the white Belgian white Belgians in the Congo were still fresh in everybody's mind and there were thoughts that this was going to happen. It didn't, as it transpired. Um, Mugabe, who came to power, was fairly pragmatic at the time, um, held up as a, a possible leader of, um, as I say, pragmatic leader. He wasn't out for vengeance or anything like that. Um, and so life could supposedly carry on as normal. But the economy was shot, absolutely shot to pieces. Um, there were no jobs available. Um, and so I struggled. I really did. So I'd lost my, my, my raison d'etre, my very existence, my, my reason for being had just gone. And um, uh, the first couple of years after independence... Um, I sort of hopped from one sort of menial sort of farm assistant type job to another um, and only really settled down job-wise in the sort of mid-80s when I got a job with uh, Shell, Shell Chemicals, uh, selling agri agricultural chemicals to the farming industry. But, yeah, those first years were very difficult, Yeah, very difficult. 